Hello, good afternoon everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's free webinar, Get Noticed with the Ultimate Startup Pitch Deck with Mark Phillips from RFR Ventures and Gadi Almirantes from Early Growth Financial Services. I'm Erica Malsberg, the Chief Marketing Officer for Early Growth Financial Services, and I'm going to be the moderator for this webinar. Um, the content portion is going to run about, I don't know, 45 minutes or so today, um, so we're hoping to leave a lot of time for Q&A because we know that people always have lots and lots of questions about pitch decks. Um, so if you do have questions as we're running through the presentation, feel free to jump in. You don't need to wait till the end. Just enter them into the question field, and we're going to try and answer questions as they come. Um, depending on time, we might wait to the end to do some at Q&A, but you know, we're, we're going to try and get to them all. You can also tweet questions to us at Early Growth FF with the hashtag pitch deck even after the um, presentation we'll be monitoring our Twitter feed and if you have questions we'll be happy to answer them we're also recording today's session so tomorrow you'll be receiving an email that's going to have a link to this slide deck and the recording so I know people always want to know that so I just want to let you know up ahead here that you don't need to be taking notes you'll be getting this deck tomorrow um, with that said, I want to start by introducing our presenters today. Um, we are honored to have back with us today Mark Phillips. Um, he's a great partner of ours, and we've done a number of wonderful webinars and, and other sorts of marketing events with Mark, and he's always a hit. <laughs> really knowledgeable and just wonderful to have. So Mark's a managing partner at RFR Ventures, a Silicon Valley-based micro-venture fund focused on technology startups and early-stage companies. He's also the author of a fantastic book that we always recommend. Um, called Inside Silicon Valley, How the Deals Get Done. If you don't already have this book, I recommend you go right to Amazon after this presentation and order it for yourself. It's just a really good insider's look into the startup, um, startup ecosystem here in Silicon Valley and has relevance beyond Silicon Valley as well. Um, so welcome and good afternoon to you, Mark. Oh, thanks, Erica. Sure. Um, we also have with us today Gadiel Morantes, um, partner with Early Growth Financial Services. So Gadiel is an accomplished executive with 15 plus years of executive and entrepreneurial experience. His vast experience working with founders and as an entrepreneur himself has given him great insight into what it takes to build successful companies. So good afternoon and hello to you, Gadiel. Thanks, Erica. Sure. Um, so before we hand it off to, to Mark to kind of run the show here, Gadiel, can you just take a, a minute or so to just um, introduce Early Growth Financial Services and what we do? Absolutely, and, and thanks for the intro. Uh, Early Growth Financial Services is an outsourced accounting firm, so we help companies um, in various stages of their life cycle, early stage, mid-sized organizations, and even some, uh, some more mature companies as they continue to grow, offering them accounting services. And it falls into four different categories, tax return preparation, filing, tax consulting, 409A valuation services, and the core business really is the day-to-day -day transactional accounting on an outsourced basis and our CFO consulting services. And where we really interact with our clients around, you know, the pitch decks, fundraising, all that kind of stuff, and working closely with Mark, is really our CFO services around building financial models and projections, helping with a pitch deck and executive summary, and really helping the company get to that fundraising ready mode. Um, we have uh, folks on the ground in eight locations throughout the U.S. Silicon Valley, San Francisco, LA, New York, Chicago, Seattle, Boulder, and Austin. And so um, happy to join and, uh, and very happy to have Mark here who's a, who's a dear friend and a fabulous partner of ours. Great. Oh, thanks, Gary. Yeah. <laughs> thanks. And so off to you, Mark. Here you go. <laughs> Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, our Afro Adventures is a, a micro VC. Uh, we're a $15 million fund. Uh, we write checks up to half a million dollars. Uh, and then, you know, we, we like to reload into Series A. Uh, that's our promise. We're really a sort of champion, you know, VP uh, for the, our, our portfolio companies, growing them from, uh, you know, small companies into Series A. So, uh, you know, we, my partner and I are both uh, serial entrepreneurs and had some success and uh, I'm Australian but lived here for 14 years and a couple of years ago I wrote this book uh, called Inside Silicon Valley which essentially takes uh, 15 odd uh, investment pitch decks and looks at each slide in an investment presentation 
from an entrepreneur and a VC's perspective. So using real uh, startups that have raised money, either I've been involved with directly or indirectly. Um, and part of today's presentation is discussing those slides within an investment pitch deck so we can give you some some you know killer ideas into how to make that you know most important half an hour an hour of your life uh, you know more successful so um, you know we can talk about that and um, perhaps a little bit more if you're interested uh, we invest across predominantly SaaS companies um, fairly agnostic in terms of location and industry and here's just a number of our investments um, typically all software and um, as I mentioned um, before you know these companies that typically receive up to you know a million a million and a half dollars over a couple of rounds um, so that's some uh, some recent investments um, Probably the hardest thing you have as an entrepreneur to do, apart from building the product, is to talk to investors. And uh, there is a, a methodology, a, a format that is time efficient and maximizes the storytelling component. And so the book uh, I wrote uh, explains these 12 slides um, in detail, or what we know here in the Valley and beyond as the investment deck and I um, think it's really important that entrepreneurs understand that you know venture firms are partnerships and those partners typically need to agree with other partners within the firm to invest in a company so even though you may be pitching one partner at a firm that partner needs to talk to or invite you back to present to other partners and then for having a standardized investment presentation um, gives some um, consistency to your presentation but also allows the venture capitalist to compare and contrast your investment pitch deck to others and so I'm going to talk today about these 12 slides and with Gabrielle's help um, you know explain to you some of the insights that we as VCs look for and so on to the first slide Really simple. Um, it's it's three threefold. First thing is, you know, a logo, obviously your business name, uh, your mission statement, positioning lines. You'd be surprised how many investment pitch decks I get that don't have these three things. And it's a bit like a book. It's a it's a movie. Um, you know, this is a, a a story that you're telling and a cover. Uh, is important, right? First impressions count. And so I always encourage entrepreneurs to say, right, what's my elevator pitch? Um, how do I create a, a visual on the first slide of my deck that tells part of the story? Because people do absorb information differently. Um, some like the positioning line, others you know, will conjure up what you do just by the image that you present. Um, perhaps the next couple of slides give you some different um, explanations of that. This um, slide you know, conveys emotion. It conveys something that's big. And that's what you're trying to do. This is a big idea. Um, here's what we do. And so I think what you're trying to do here is give uh, the investor a sense of what it is pictorially. Uh, as well as editorially what you're doing and get them excited if you can about um, about what it is. Uh, look, sometimes investment decks have the uh, management team up the front. Obviously if you know the investors you're, or you've been introduced, um, you may not, or you're very credentialed or your team is, you may not need to put this um, into the front end of the slide deck, but I think just it's important that if you if you do have a, a, you know a stellar rock star team, if you don't, well, um, you know maybe you'll just explain who you are and what your what your background is. More importantly, I think just 
logos speak, you'll see this slide, you know, recognizable logos. But I would just keep your uh, management team slide to two or three bullet points per person. Pat, where you've previously worked, education, and you know what your focus is. Right. The aim here is not to get into a CV. That's what you can find on LinkedIn um, or bio pages on on the management page of the website. This is more about hey, you know, pictures, icons with logos of where the teams work. You're trying to build rapid credibility. Uh, we, we have our first question here from the audience, Mark um, and Gadiel. Uh, Joe wants to know if you have a lean management team that's maybe not as impressive as this example before you, would you perhaps combine um, board of advisors with your management team slide or how do you approach that? Gadiel? Uh, you know, I, it's funny. I was actually just going to a question up for you, Mark, on the whole management team's you know side of things. Where it comes to a lot of very early stage companies will actually outsource parts and pieces of their company, whether it's development, whether it's you know some management consultants, things like that. You know, I think what I see mostly is focusing on the core team and that core team that's going to build out you know the company or that's fully invested in the build out of the company. But I think it's it's important to you know, to not to not crowd this slide, if you will, um, and I'd love to get your thoughts as well, because I, I have seen it the other way, where it's, hey, we've got a core team of three, but then we've got a bunch of uh, additional pieces that are part of this team. It just starts blurring it a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Uh, most you know startups want to you know, appear bigger than what they are. Um, and 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 I, I I think it's important just to keep it fairly lean as well, Gadiel. Um, this slide here, you know, you've got some rock star uh, management, and so they're really showing it out. But if it's just you and your partner, um, and you've got some outsourced programmers, you don't necessarily want to put those outsourced programmers, you know, pictures and profiles on this management page. Later in the slide deck, I talk about you know advisors, which are important. Um, so if you are early, I'd, I'd try and get some um, credentialed advisors, and but definitely don't put people that aren't full time uh, here. I think part time, or he's working there, but he's joining, or she's joining after we raise the money. That's kind of a little presumptuous. I would just state the fact. So if it is just two of you, great. You know, um, keep it to you to you both of you, or you know, the team of three. So don't feel as if you've got to um, you know, create create a slide that involves a lot of people when they're not actually um, you know working in the company full time. I mean, uh, you you want to sort of appeal to the investor because the investor office obviously wants to see themselves as part of your growth, right? So, you know, they don't expect you to say, I've got this and I've got every everything covered, right? Um, there's, there's a couple of thoughts on that. Great, thank you. So the second slide, very quickly in your presentation, you want to move to, look, there's a problem, it's a big problem, and this is how, you know, this is how we came across this problem. Do not go into war and peace and a long story about how you know you were on a train and a plane and a bus and you came across this problem and you know just state what the problem is um, because if it's a big enough problem you know the venture capitalist investor will appreciate and understand that that's a common problem and or a problem that needs solving um, you know another way to think of it is what's the aha moment but don't give a sort of a, a war and peace, you know, version of it. Just say, look, this is what we do. Slide one. Here's the problem we've got, and quickly move into um, the 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 solution. Now, I bring this example up because this was a slide. Actually, if we go back to that previous, yeah, thanks, Erica. Um, you look at this slide. This is a deck, 
that I saw, and it, and it confused me, right? Because there's like five problems here, and I'm like, okay, so you're doing it as I'm speaking. Why does it suck? And I've got five different components of this slide. So you can compare the previous slide where it had, you know, black bubbles on an orange background with the problem versus this slide, which is busy and um, convoluted. So I wanted to draw your attention to there may be multiple problems. It is often a multi-problem solution, right? That you, you're trying to trying to start your business um, to solve. But I think what you want to do is say, if it is a multi-part problem or there are multiple problems, start with one problem. And the easiest thing to do is it's the biggest problem, right? So, um, and then quickly get into the solution because an investor is sitting there; they want to see what you've got, right? We are always on telephones and face-to-face -face meetings trying to work out what it is that you've got, what's the solution, right? That makes the most sense to us and that excites us. So what we do, who we are, um, what the problem is are great. But you should be able to move through that relatively quickly. Often an investment pitch, keep it to two to three minutes, maybe four minutes at max and get to the solution, right? Now, Show not tell is the mandate here. Um, you know, the shining new thing is what we're all interested and excited about. About so, whether it's a series of screenshots, whether you're bringing out a new piece of hardware that you pull out of your pocket and put on the desk, or whether you're segueing into a a video demonstration of the product, or logging into the dashboard to show the software module. This is the um, the really juicy part of the pitch, right? So you want to lead the investor into this expectation that you're going to pay off in this um, slide. And so I think, you know, theatrically, from a you know storytelling perspective, you want to sort of cue this up to be in the sort of three to four minute mark. Don't keep your investor waiting 10, 15 minutes to talk about the the macro environment and how you came to the solution and what the problem is. You want to, within that four to five minute mark, say, here it is, Shazam, I've opened the curtain, you know, have a look at what we're doing. And so there's a couple of other slides here that we, uh, we can see. Again, this is a slide that I saw, it's a solution slide and you can see, wow, this is, I've got to process this. Uh, you know, okay, yeah, and often the solution is multi-part, again, it's issues that you've got modules, you've got different um, uh, products that fall under the solution, and, and, and often it's very worthy and you need to talk about the solution. So uh, I think using, you know, icons, graphs, charts, screen captures, but try and make the solution very, very visual. You've got to make sure that the, you're not being too esoteric or um, non-tangible because VCs want to latch onto it. Uh, we're human as well. We need to be shown, not told. Let me move to the next slide, Erica. And really quickly, um, Mark, just to just to jump in on that. Um, as we're building and as a you know a founder and entrepreneur is putting this together, you know, and, and trying to get meetings with uh, investors like yourselves, they're budgeting for half hour meetings or are they typically hour meetings? Um, what, what do you normally carve out for a pitch like this? Because obviously there's a level of interest already or else you wouldn't let them into your office to actually do a formal pitch, right? Yeah, yeah I think, great question. Um, always plan on your pitch being able to be delivered in half an hour. And so if you go back, if we think about those 12 slides, if you just give no more than two minutes per slide, that puts you at 24 minutes with five minutes of question. Right? So often a venture capitalist will say, let's jump on a call. If they're really interested, they've got the hour. If they're not and they've got a hard stop at 30 minutes, you can get through it. But you want to pace yourself 
to go, I'm going to get through this pitch deck in two minutes max per slide. And if you need to, put your iPhone, watch, stopwatch, whatever on your desk in front of you or mentally chew it in your rehearsals that you're going to have no more than two minutes per slide. And when you're nervous and anxious and you're at you know, the VC's office or you know, your a question comes up, you may trip over that two minute mark, but keep moving. You know, I think it's really important to control the momentum of the presentation because the VC thinks, hang on, this 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 is good, I'm moving through and if I've got questions I'll ask them. But you can always very politely say, you know, happy to take, you know, go drill into that into a little bit more detail. In fact you know, from a negotiation perspective, it makes sense if you ask, answer the question briefly and say, there's a longer discussion we should have about this. And really what you're doing there is inviting the venture capitalist to engage with you further, right? Because if they say we've got half an hour but they want to know more, you can say, I want to get through my presentation, right, in a, in a diplomatic and polite, courteous way. Um, and, I, and I just think, you know, we are, uh, as, as media consumers or you know purveyors of storytelling we're used to the, the, the story going the TV show the talk show the podcast um, we're used to having the programmer you know um, keep us on an agenda in terms of time so I, I feel that you should always plan Gadiel for that 30 minute hard stop but uh, take questions but keep that two minute per slide max um, slot in your mind and then hopefully you get that extra 10, 15, 20 minutes at the venture capitalist. You can always go back to slide three and five and seven in the presentation after you've finished. You don't have to stall on slide, you know, slide three for 15 minutes and then you can say, you know what guys, we're out of time and you're racing through six slides, which is just as important. So. Be aware that the venture capitalists will get very interested in some slides, but also you want to keep them engaged for a follow-up meeting, hopefully with you know more of their partners. Um, obviously, the aim is to get you know the next meeting, um, whether that's face-to-face, -face, right? If you're on the phone, it's to come into the office or let's meet. Um, and then you also want to engage with more of the partnership. I mean, I, I just we do it where we're always saying to entrepreneurs, look, this is really interesting, why don't we have a follow-up call, I'll get my partner involved, let's drill down on a product demo or let's talk about the big three things. I think that's a very important point there um, because, you know, to your point, like this half hour meeting, it's just part of the process and the hope is you're always pushing to that next meeting and the next meeting may be the including more partners or even starting the diligence process from the investor standpoint. So it's almost the way I like to carve it out is you have that initial introduction to the venture capitals where you're sharing an executive summary and sometimes sharing a, a lighter pitch deck or even this pitch deck and then that you're driving to get that in-person half hour meeting and then after that the next driver for you is not to capture you know the investment in that half hour, I mean that would be awesome but really it's hey we're teeing it up for that next meeting where we're bringing in more uh, stakeholders on the VC side and having that longer, you know, starting to go through that diligence piece of it. So it's always, you're getting yourself to that next rung and that, that part of it's important. Yeah, yeah, you know, cat and mouse trap the venture capitalist almost, right, Gadiel, into, you know, you want them feeling as if you've moved on from a slide, that their question or their inquisition, you know, their inquiry is not fully satisfied, right? And then take note, right, you and your partner, take note, right, that the venture capitalist was not, you know, wanted to drill down more, but we moved him on or her on and we'll circle back around, right? Um, slide four, the market side. So, you know, now is your opportunity to say, I've told you what the problem is. I've excited you with the product. Now I'm going to tell you this is a big market, right? And the math can be very simple. It's a you know, $10 billion market and here's why. 
And I think if you want to be able to show, if it's not obvious, like the market for, you know, for security software or um, you know, search or you know, mobile phone apps, something that's a little futuristic, you, you want to be able to mathematically compute or calculate what that size is. And that just shows the VC, if they've got any doubts that they can't just say, well, you know, that's a huge market, that you've actually done the research and there's you know, verifiable third-party quantitative analysis of it. Um, the market size can be broken down on the next slide into a couple of different segments. Um, the yellow segment there is the total size, and this is a, a hardware play. And then the serviceable market is what we can really go after, and then there's the initial. So serviceable is often the addressable, um, these are interchangeable, so it's often called you know, SAM, service addressable market, or just the addressable market. It's not the total market, it's what our product will go after. Um, but then there's always the initial, right? You're not going to try and sell to all, all markets out of the gate. That's why you're raising your initial round. So you want to, at this juncture, say, look, it's a huge market, but we're just going to go after this initial market, right? Um, and that, that might be by industry, it might be by geography, it might be by price point. Um, and therefore, you want to say to your VC, okay, we're also astute, right? We understand that this is a huge market, but there's a way, given you know the one or two or three million dollars we're raising in this round, we're going to get to. But here's our initial market. Um, so that's that's another way to think about the market size slide. So we, we have a quick a question here from Cyril about market opportunity. And, uh, you know, what you're showing here is a slide that demonstrates a, a large market opportunity. He wants to know if the market is small now, but it's in very high growth mode, um, would you show proof that the market's growing or speculative market sizes five years away? Or how can you demonstrate that this, this is a growing market opportunity? How best to do that? Gadiel, I'll go first. Um, you know, this morning I had a pitch from a virtual reality content aggregation platform company. And, you know, the question in the market opportunity slide that I asked was, you know, how easy is it for, you know, VR content to be produced and how quickly is that content being produced? And, um, you know, the, the entrepreneurs couldn't answer it. And so I think it's you know, very important to show at this stage if it's an emerging market, the growth of the market. Um, and how do you show that's up to you, but definitely showing growth or anticipated growth. Analyst reports, third party research studies obviously help. Um, you know, I'm a previous analyst, so that's the type of, you know, comp compound annual growth rate reports we used to write on internet technologies back in the late 90s. So. It is important, there's no doubt about it. Yeah, I agree with you. And this is a big piece of kind of what we end up helping a lot of our clients with is trying to identify what that market opportunity is. I think the bigger the market, obviously the more attractive that um, that opportunity can be. But I, but I also think, and I think you're, you're kind of alluding to it is, you know, has the entrepreneur and founder and the company really gone through the steps of trying to capture all that data and information and understand it? Um, it's okay to be targeting a young market, but I think the more data and information you gather and, and try to extrapolate from that, I think will just help you in the conversations you have with investors. And it's okay, it's okay not to know what that final market size is, but I think it's very important to be able to prove to those investors that the way you're going to approach the market is is uh, realistic and that you've thought through each of those components and each of those numbers as you're trying to build your story. The fifth slide is this. Um, I've shown you our solution and I've told you how big the market is. So the VC should be excited. But they've probably got some questions which is, okay, I see the, you know, the product, 
but I want to understand a little bit of the inner workings, the, the architecture, what's under the hood. And at this juncture, you want to drill into, um, you know, the technology, what the, the USP is, what the secret source is. It's always, you know, if you're the CEO, founder, and you're the talking head of the duo, you may want to defer to your technology co-founder, you know, the, so the VCs get a sense that, right, now the tech guy is going to talk about, you know, the product, the technology, the IP, et cetera. Um, and don't just talk, again, show. Present, and the next couple of slides, you'll see different architectures. But again, you know, people consume information in different ways. Um, here's a good slide because it shows the interface, uh, the screen of the software, but it also shows the proprietary engines, the databases, the servers, the interoperability of the process. And, you know, from a user flow back to the technology. And I think, you know, being able to talk to investors this way um, is important. You've got to, basically slide five is how it works. Um, don't gloss over it. It's a good way to represent what your technology is. Um, you know, is it full stack? What sort of UI does it have? How do all the bits, you know, connect together? Um, you know, how does the database talk to the APIs? Um, how does a user engage with it? You'd be surprised how many times I sit in at this juncture of an investment deck and I'm like, I have no idea how this product is onboarded with customers. Do I sign up? Is a client install? Is it an app? Do I have to get, um, you know, does this have to be deployed across my network? So I think it's important to talk about how it works from a user's perspective and then from an architecture product perspective as well. It's simple, it makes sense, but, you know, it's at this point that I feel that this is the right time to talk about it. Uh, these guys raised a couple of million dollars last year and I, you know, look how simple it is, right? You can see. Um, developer downloads the SDK, it's cloud-based, um, you know, there's a server, there's a phone, there's an SDK, right? Product architecture, how it works. Visual, low amount of text, quite, quite easy to understand and comprehend. Um, and around this stage, you want to talk about, you know, the IP, the defensibility, and more importantly, the scalability. How does your technology grow fast, right? Think Slack, think um, Airbnb, uh, you know, think Uber, think YouTube, PayPal. How is this fast growing? Because that's what we want. We want to be shown and... Um, convinced that your technology is scalable. It'll grow fast. People will want it. Onboarding's easy and it's defensible and there's IP. So this is a way of this slide. Don't, do not pitch investors unless you can talk about this slide. Um, I think it's critical that you do because it's always a question that we want. Um, we want answered. If there are significant barriers to entry, um, like you know a patent portfolio, um, that you know the founders have deep domain expertise, um, that there is you know patents that have been uh, registered, uh, you want to talk about it. It's not always purely scalable. You may have been in R and D for a number of years, right? Spun out of you know a research lab. Um, you hold patents. There is, you know, deep domain expertise um, of the founders in an industry that only you and your team know because you were privy to them, because you worked at, you know, a research lab um, for many years, and that's where you uncovered the problem and came out with the solution. So I think that this is a, a really important part of of uh, of the technology. Why it's defensible? Why can't other people copy it? as easily and readily. Um, 
So, yeah. Uh, just while we're talking about the pitch, just some pitch tips, and feel free to chime in, Gadiel. Uh, here's just a cheat sheet, really. Um, you know, we always say to entrepreneurs, look, always defer to investors that can re-up. You know, we're all reading about Series A crunch and the new acronym or uh, buzzword around is party investors, which refer to um, you know angel investors that will invest it on a, on a sort of a dinner party mentality. Oh, my friend's in it, and I'm in it. He's 20. You know, trying to balance your investment or your cap table with different investors, some of which can re up. Um, keep your your talk in an investor pitch relatively short. Um, Try not to get into hand waving and acronyms and technical speak because even though you feel that your the VCs are meant to be, you know, really intelligent, um, they often don't know a lot of stuff. And you know, you want to not gloss over um, details, but equally you don't want to go deep into some sort of, you know, prove to the VCs how smart and intelligent you are because you can lose them, right? Um, body language I think is really important. I always watch for it. I talk about it in the book a little bit. Um, you know, you always keep positive, open you know, body language. Um, you're really inviting advice. You know, you're showing investors that you're not defensive and you're not closed-minded by your body language. Um, I think it's really important to always maintain eye, maintain eye contact with investors. Um, I mentioned before balancing your presentation with your co-founder or your CTO. We want to see that you are in fact a team, that you're working together, that you're in sync and you've got good good uh, balance between you. Um, you know, because that, that, that's important, healthy debate and, you know, CEO, CTO, co-founders need to co coexist together. Um, you know, at an early stage, you're obviously investing in a team um, and how well that team gets on. Um, lots of times, VCs, as you know, will say, look, I just don't think the team's right. It's not cohesive. There's not good good uh, balance. Um, it's one of the things we worry about a lot is how well the team's going to perform. What VCs don't tell entrepreneurs is, you know, their doubts about how the team can execute. Um, I've mentioned pace, con consistent momentum. Um, I think be prepared for conflict. Some VCs are quite, you know, protagonistic. They will, you know, fake a question to see if you really know. Often they do know more than you because they've invested in another company or they've, they've got real life experience before they were venture capitalists. So they will challenge you and often, you know, argue a point just to see how you respond. Um, you know, not for the sake of doubting you, but um, often, you know, VCs will just challenge you point blank and see if you can control your emotion, how you how you respond, because there will be tough times um, where there's a lot of criticism and. Um, uh, you know, and be prepared for that conflict. I think it's really important to connect with anecdotes and analogies because you can often lose yourself in the technology in detail. And when you're talking about often ill-defined markets or nascent technologies or future plans, it's hard to grasp. And therefore, you want to be able to talk with um, analogies and anecdotes of real life things, places, people, previous companies, because we can actually understand those, because we use those products or experience those services in our daily lives. Um, the last tip is always, you know, team market size product. And if you've got two or three of them, two of three of those, emphasize them. Because a lot of VCs will look for those and say, great team, big market, not sure about the product, but the team I think can execute, and the market's so huge, right? Or it's a massive market, and this product is just really good, but the team's not that great. So 
will invest with the understanding that will help them round out their team. So keep in mind that you know uh, seed, post seed investors will always think about two of these three um, components when they're evaluating at a high level. Gadiel, did you have any? You're involved in a lot of pitch pitches and with hundreds of startup companies. I know that you get to review and and sit in a lot of pitches. Do you have any insights as well? No, I, I think you're you're hitting on a lot of these. I do, you know, the one big tip that I have is the fact that, you know, these entrepreneurs and founders, it's their company, it's their baby. They really understand the ins and outs, and it's almost, you know, you're kind of talking to it like you got to help dumb it down for the rest of us, right? It's we don't we're not in the weeds with your company and understanding what you're building. We may understand the the overall picture, but that's what you're trying to paint here. Once you get into the jargon and the technical speak and all that, you can really lose the uh, the opportunity with those investors. And I think it's you know let the investor and in, once you get in that meeting, let them point you into that direction because you will have some that are very technical and understand exactly what you're talking about and others that understand the bigger picture so it's really tailoring that in your in your that in your that in your meeting with them so it's also as much as you're speaking it's like any other type of conversation that you have actively listen and try to address those concerns and questions and, and guide yourself that way let them guide you a little bit that that's the big takeaway that I that I have um, with a lot of the founders that we work with. Great, we have a we have some questions, but you know what? I'm I'm worried that we've given the caveat that the <laughs> when they're pitching, they shouldn't get stuck on a slide and not get through all the material. So I'm gonna let you guys race through to the end, and and we'll use the time at the end to ask questions. So why don't you move on to slide seven, Mark? Now you've told them about the product, the solution how big the market is, um, how are you going to get the product out? Um, you know, are we going to go to the college crowd? Are we going to go through LinkedIn? Are we going to do a um, you know, viral email campaign? Are we going to use resellers? Are we going to uh, use OEMs and value-added distributors? How are we going to get the product out? And you want to be thinking about this. And this slide, very importantly, should triangulate with your financial um, projection slide, right? So when we get to the financial projection slide, think about this slide as well, because we want to be able to know that because you know, you're focused on product at this stage, right? You know, we're building the product, we've spent months, and we've got our alpha, and we've got some trial customers, and it works, and here are the results, and we're raising seven fifty thousand to go to market, right? Well. You know, you've got to actually think through the go-to-market and the distribution and not just put it on the slide but talk to people. Um, I often think it's really important to have an advisor if you're tech orientated that has been in sales and marketing. If you're pre-sales and marketing, um, don't have a BD, a biz dev person hired um, and some of our portfolio companies are in that space, you do have to be thinking about distribution even though you're building the next version of the product. But that's all I'm going to talk about there. Look, there's three slides here on competitive matrix. I think we all understand that you know, the hardest and most time consuming thing for a VC and our associates and analysts is doing competitive analysis. There usually is competitors, are competitors. If you don't know them, we'll find them. So find them for us and do yourself a favor by saying they are good at these features and functions and attributes, but we're better. They don't have this, they have that, this is why. It's much more enjoyable um, and rewarding having a conversation with um, entrepreneurs about the competitive landscape and why there is a gap in the market that the current in incumbents aren't filling and because that's obviously part of the opportunity. Um, and so I think what I'm really explaining on slide eight here on the next slide as well is how to produce that 
that matrix. You can do it in an XY axis. You can do it in a, a quadrant chart, which is done here. And the next slide, you'll see that you can also do it um, as a, um, you know, in another visual format. So, um, so there's different ways, but you know, don't think that we're not going to uh, find competitors because we we want to know. We don't expect you to have a green field. In fact, you know, competitive activity in a in a in a uh, technology sector validates the market um, and gives us some comfort that we're not investing alone. Right. So it de-risks the investment. Revenue projections. Um, no, we don't want to see a uh, three-sheet uh, Excel spreadsheet that's you know 50 lines long. We'd like to know it's there, um, but I think in the initial meeting, keep it to one slide. You know how you break out your revenues and your revenue line on this slide should map the go-to distribution right on slide seven. I mentioned it before, so. And then the operating expenses should be broken into kind of, you know, wages, general and admin, if there are any capital expenses. But you want to keep it pretty top line. I like to see two to four years. Um, and I like to see what the head count is and the burn. So that EBITDA, you'll see the burn, the head count, because I want to get a sense of, you know, at, at the revenue projection slide, if, if I, okay, you know, the burn over 24 months is going to be you know, 1.5 million, but, you know, they should be raising maybe 2 million or more, but you want to get a sense of what the dynamics, what the headcount is going to be, what the revenue is going to be, um, what the burn rate is going to be. Gadiel, you know, with you feel free to chime in here what's really important because I know that you know a lot of entrepreneurs turn to early uh, growth to to you know, do their financial forecasts um, and, and as we do we'll often say to entrepreneurs you need a good outsource CFO um, and and or the, the the assumptions upon which that you're basing your you know cash flow and forecasts and hiring revenue plans often should be validated by a, a, a financial person. Um, Absolutely. I, I think that's, you know, that's exactly right. And when, you know, to your point, I think keeping it simple on these slides so that it's, you know, you're communicating to the investors, we've thought through the plan, we've worked with somebody on putting this together, I understand the plan. That That's very, very important in understanding the, the numbers behind um, you know, basically the story behind the numbers and being our, being able to articulate articulate that to investors. Um, you know, you mentioned building out that plan. What does it look like? I mean, we're typically seeing three to five year projections, but really that focus is on on three years worth of projections, just because it starts getting a little hairy at four at the fourth year and fifth year because many companies. Um, you know, take a pivot or, you know, there's changes in the business, things like that. But really locking down those first three years can be really, really important. Um, and like I said, we, you know, we work with a lot of uh, folks around that area and, and a big piece of that is coaching them up on, you know, this is where we're coming up with the numbers and really understanding that the financial aspect of it because it, it matters and, and the burn is huge. It, it's something that you really need to understand as you're building your company. Yeah, I've just given a couple of different ways back to the financial, sorry Erica. Um, you know, visuals on financials, not everyone likes to see um, just, you know, columns of numbers, right? Um, you know, often charts, particularly when you've got multiple revenues, coming from different segments, like here's a, you know, five-year forecast, but it's broken into an analytics revenue, SaaS revenue, um, and then the profit. And I think this is a really good way of saying pictorially, you know, graphically, we do 
you know, what we're selling, the revenue is broken into two different bits. Because obviously, you know, if you're a software company, you want to be able to say, well, you know, we've got we've got revenue from different sources, but we're going to make it easy for you, Mr. Investor, to understand. Um, so pictorially as well as numbers can often convey and 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 um, your business model, uh, your uh, you know, your revenue in a, in an easily digestible way. So there's some some good uh, slides there for you. Um, I mentioned before advisors. If you don't have a lot of staff, um, get some advisors. Um, I always say give advisors between you know point two or one percent of stock over 12, 18 months. Um, you know, set up a stock option pool. Always choose advisors that first and foremost and always you enjoy their company, that you respect them and they respect you and they're from different industries. They can help you with distribution, they can help you with financials, they can help you with you know, engineering, um, they can help you with introductions. Um, but more importantly that they are a trusted confidant because um, you know, advisors are meant to do that, give you advice um, and not just take the stock. So I always say sign Advisory uh, agreements, you know, uh, always uh, give stock that, um, you know, let's say 0.2 of 1% of the stock option pool have two or three advisors. Maybe that equals up to 1% of the of the stock pool. Give it out over 12, 18 months. You're giving equity in return for advice, and um, it, it typically, if you choose well pays off very handsomely. You know, it might be your first customer, um, you know, it leads to different hires, it gets you into doors that you just can't get into. And so uh, advisors also give the venture capitalists good good people to talk to. Um, you know, it, it, it uh, validates the initial idea um, and also, you know, it gives you a, without having a board of directors, and you often don't have one, um, it gives you people to talk to and bounce ideas off. Yeah, we do a, a great webinar on uh, on the advisor piece of it, and I think it, it is very important to, to bring in those partners. And, and your advisors can change, right? Your first year, year and a half of business, um, it may be different folks than you know that second year and third year of business. I mean, this is a group that that changes and molds over time because you as a company need need different things in different areas. And then the second last slide is, you know, always tell the VC I'm raising X at a Y valuation. I know some, you know, a lot of folks say, look, the valuation's yet to be determined and we're in early stage discussion, but, you know, if you walk into Walmart or Target or Macy's, you know, and you you want to know the price, and I, and I think, at least me personally, I'm like, tell me how much you're raising at what valuation, because a lot of us have valuation ranges, right? You know, angel investors were happy to invest through Y Combinator in a forty million dollar you know valuation company that doesn't have any revenue, because you know that's the that's the type of high risk investment. Other VCs will say, "Look, we can't go over, you know, 10x in revenue, or if it's in healthcare, or it's longer sales cycle, um, so we can only invest at a, at a certain multiple." So, just be aware that you know VCs have in the back of their mind um, a valuation range. It may not be a specific valuation. So, you want to share that up front. And then you don't have to drill down into every nickel and dime how you're going to spend it, but give them a sense. Look, we're going to employ four engineers and one DD. We're going to spend the money um, over, you know, our burn's going to be 50, 75 a month over 18 months, and this is the, the, sort of the major milestone um, that we're going to get to over that 12, 18 month period. And the last slide is, and not always does it need to be in a presentation, um, but it's, you know, who's going to buy it? How do you get your money back? And I feel, I personally like to see it because 
I like to think, hmm, I do know someone at Cisco. I am going to ring them after this call and say, yeah, I just got off the phone to an, an entrepreneur and he's telling me all about you know, next generation routers or IP networking and what's Cisco doing? Oh, we're not doing them. We're very interested. Um, I did that last month um, with, with one of the M&A guys at Cisco. So, you know, we do do it. Other VCs don't want the founders distracted or thinking that they're going to go after an acquisition um, because they want them focused on the market and it's rare that, you know, the acquirer is known to the entrepreneur at the time of raising. So that's the slide deck in its 12 um, part entirety and um, feel free to ask any questions. Uh, we do have a couple of questions here. They're both uh, kind of financial focus. So uh, I don't know, Gadiel, if you want to uh, take the first pitches here. But first, we have a question from Nilu, um, who wants to know which financial slides and content should you provide if you're pre-revenue? If you're pre, I mean that's yeah, really, I mean, really interesting question. Yeah, <laughs> so it, I think it's a little hard. I think and, and Mark jump in, but I think if you're pre-revenue, I think what you're thinking through on those slides is is where will I generate revenue, right? If you're um, have you thought through, you know, th there's aspects of the model that are going to say, hey, you know, you know, today we're pre-revenue, but in six months we're going to have revenue, and these are the revenue sources that we're going to you know, get the revenue from, you know, we still hear the, oh, we're a freemium model, but that, you know, at some point you, you have to make money, whether it's through advertising or something else. So I think it's those parts that you're going to want to communicate to investors. Um, on that end, Mark, I mean, a lot of the companies you're seeing are, are pre-revenue companies, but they still need to have some type of revenue on their on their financial slides to justify an investment at the end of the day, right? Did we lose Mark? I, I'm not sure. Mark, are you still there? Uh, let's give him a moment and see if he'll if he'll jump in and answer that question. Um, the other question that we got asked, Gadiel, is is quite similar to that one. So you know, I'm not even going to ask it. I I think it's still that idea of if you don't if you aren't monetizing it, if you're not generating revenue, what are you supposed to do, and and how do you make yourself appealing to investors? So um, if anyone has asked a question and we did not answer it, and you feel like the content here did not answer your question, you see our uh, contact information here. So please feel free to reach out to us. You can email Mark directly or email us at contact us and we will get back to you that way. Um, we also offer a free 30-minute financial consultation so if you have specific questions about financial projections or things like that and, and want to know if we might be able to be of service please definitely check out our website and click on that and we can follow up with you. Um, that said I think we've lost Mark so I was going to say a big thank you but hopefully wherever he is he's hearing that. <laughs> So I hope, we hope you found this uh, useful, um, seeing these real-life slides. It's always a very popular webinar that we do to see pitch decks that work. Are you there? I, I, sadly, I lost everyone. So you I did. Thought. That's okay. You're, you're there. We, we uh, left you mid-question. I don't know if you heard what Gadiel was asking you about, uh, you know, if people are pre-revenue, how do they still, what, what do you want to see in their financial projection slide? Yeah, definitely at that point. Sorry, I dropped off. Um, but uh, you definitely want to actually just prove to the investor that you're financially astute, that you're not just, you know, non, that you have some commercial mouth and you have a business idea um, of how the company is going to commercialize and run. And so, you know, even, even though that the financial forecast might be off, if they're based on assumptions, and hence why you, you know, use a, a CFO out for a firm like um, early, early growth, is because you want the VC to think, okay, they may not have got the price right, but they are financially astute. They understand financial forecasting. Because let, let's face it, the numbers are always um, you know, in revision, going to be advised, market shifts. But it's more about showing the VCs that you are not only great at building products, 
um, and managing a team and identifying a huge problem is a great solution, but you do understand how the financials and the commercial business models work. Um, and that's obviously what investors help to do, right? Um, work with you because they're putting in money. They will they will usher and guide your uh, your financial forecasts as well and help you review them. So I hope that helps, Erica. Great, perfect. And you know we're we're right here at the one o'clock hour, so I'm gonna I'm gonna cut us short here and be respectful of everyone's time. Um, thank you so much, Mark and Gadi. It's great. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Uh, of, of course, always happy to have you. And um, folks, you will receive the email tomorrow with the deck and the recording, so you can reference back to those. We're in the process of putting together our webinar calendar for the next few months, so I don't have any to promote to you right now. But um, please check back in with our events page. You know when you get a chance, and you'll see what webinars we have coming up and be able to register there. So thank you all so much and have a great day, everyone. Thanks, Gadiel. Thanks, Erica. Bye-bye. Thank you, Mark.